Well, it's exciting again to be back together as a family of God this Sunday to worship Him as a community of grace and spirit and in truth as we come this Sunday to our closing and final sermon in our series of 1 Thessalonians. This is our last sermon in a series in which we have really worked hard throughout this series to see really and truthfully the characteristics, those biblical principles of a godly church as we seek to be a church that's honoring to God both in our word as well as in our walk, especially in our worship and then in our witness each and every day as we exit today and enter back into community life in our neighborhoods, in the workplace, we want to honor him in our witness. As I said earlier, in a sense, uh, reading a little bit of voice this week, it kind of sums up some of the themes here in 1 Thessalonians that I think the Apostle Paul was writing and encouraging this church at Thessalonica as it was in some sense a small church, but a very influential church, a critical and strategic church at a location. And as he writes, certain themes surface. One is that we are to be a joyous people as I shared earlier, the joy of our salvation should reign and rule in our hearts each and every day and each and every week, that as we enter into the community, people realize that our hearts have been transformed, not by our doing, but by the doing of Almighty God, and we can't wait to share that story with Him. One of the exciting meetings this week was a meeting in which we had the opportunity to sit down and begin kind of a strategic planning session about EE and evangelism explosion and how we can continue to empower one of the pillars of our congregation in evangelism to share the joy, to share the hope that is within us. And so a joyous people, as well as a separated people, this is another theme throughout the book of Thessalonians, that God has set us apart, not to be separated from community, but truthfully, beloved, we are a separate, separated group of people in that Christ, through his blood, has set us apart. We're not to be withdrawn from others, but we're not to be like others in that our lifestyle is to be developed by the power of the Holy Spirit, developing within us a Christian character. And that's another theme throughout this lesson uh, and this book, as well as we're to be, as Boyce calls it, a truth-rooted people. Our faith is founded in truth. It is founded in the, on the authority of the Word of God, and we are about speaking the truth, sharing the truth. We do not believe in relative, relativistic truth, or truth is relative. No, we believe that truth is absolute. It is rooted and grounded in the authority of Jesus Christ and in His Word. We know that we live in a postmodern day in which truth is relative. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something and you are sincere about it. That is what our universities teach us, and in many ways that is what our world teaches us. The answer to that question, though, is simply this. You can be sincere all day, but you can be sincerely wrong. Exactly. And so we believe in an absolute truth that is rooted on the word of Almighty God and in Christ alone. We're called as well to be a missionary people, to be a people that have a desire to share this truth, not only in our local community, but throughout the world. Another great meeting this week was with our missions committee, in which already we have over 30 missionaries. And this committee is so fired up, they wanted to add another 30. And I said, guys, hold on a second here. Whoa, wait a minute, let's, let's make sure we got the budget first. But they were motivated, and that inspired my heart that they wanted to see the love of Christ spread throughout the world. A missionary people, a loving people, and that really is the theme throughout the book of Thessalonians in which as Christ, as Paul talks about Christ's second coming and waiting with a sense of hope, we are to be a loving people. And to be a loving people, we must be a people 
who get to know one another where there is fellowship. Fellowship requires getting to know your neighbor, asking them their name, learning about their children, wanting to a desire to hear their story. It's so important as these things build fellowship. And as we continue to grow, both spiritually but also numerically, there's always that tension, that healthy tension that will pull against fellowship. So we have to find creative ways through small groups to build this fellowship. And already we have those kinds of groups. Whether it is prime timers or youth or young adults, there are ways that we are working and praying to find that kind of unity that builds a strong sense of community. But as we look at our passage this morning, I want to talk about another aspect, though, that Paul talks about throughout this uh, book as we close this morning our last sermon, and that is a unified people or a people of peace. A people of peace. If you look with me again at the scripture that Jerry read, you will see a little phrase in there where he says, We asked you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Basically, Paul is just reminding the church at Thessalonica to remember the elders, to remember those deacons, to remember those men who are working, who are sacrificing, who are volunteering of their time to serve and to build a congregation. And then he says, be at peace. This is where we're going to focus this morning. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, that little phrase, be at peace among yourselves. And then he goes on and he says, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice. There is that word joy again. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We're going to focus this morning on that little phrase, be at peace among yourselves. Let us now prepare as we go to the Lord for a moment of silent prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be at peace this morning in our hearts. That we would experience the peace that passes all understanding. And that you might guard our hearts and our minds. And Lord, if there is someone here this morning who is not at peace, I ask by the end of this morning that your mercy and your grace would draw them to the shepherd who will grant them the peace that passes all understanding in you alone. Amen. As we think about this theme of peace and a church being at peace, you know, I, I heard this week a funny statement that says, peace is that brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. <laughs> Lloyd Corey was the, quoted that, and I couldn't help but just start laughing. That brief, glorious moment when everyone stands around reloading. Think about it. Well, I pray this morning, beloved, that, that you have experienced that peace of Christ. It's one of the cardinal key cornerstones, if you will, of a church, a peaceful community, and where people feel that they can walk in and they experience the reverence of Almighty God. They experience His holiness. They experience His mercy. They experience His grace. But there is something that is peaceful about the community. How important that is in a world that is confused. In a world in where anxiety reigns and rules. No different today than it was 2,000 years ago as the Apostle Paul wrote those words in Philippians, be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication let your requests be made known to God and the peace 
that passes all understanding, all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. That is what we pray for this morning, that we might be a people of peace. We might be peacemakers. As we come to this table in a little while, it represents the peace that we now have with Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ. Horatio Spafford, who was a great businessman in Chicago, understood this deep peace in a painful way. He sent his family over to Europe on a, on a cruise, and he was going to follow up in a few weeks to take another ship and join them. Halfway across the ocean there, on the way to Europe, there was a huge storm and a shipwreck, and he lost three daughters. His wife survived, and she, sent a wi she wired back and said, everyone is lost, except I survived. Think about the pain, the guilt, the hurt, and I'm sure all the emotions that was in her life, in her heart, but also in his as the father. And so he immediately caught the next ship out of the harbor, and as he got to approximately where the shipwreck happened, the captain pointed out this is approximately where it took place, and then he went away and he got a pen and paper, and he penned these words as a prayer. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whate'er my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. In the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, he understood where real peace came from. He understood that Jesus Christ was the anchor in the midst of the storm of his soul. What about you this morning, beloved? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your rock, he is your refuge, that he is your anchor in the midst of the storm? For there will be storms throughout your life. And is your heart this morning at peace? And I want to talk this morning about two types of peace. First of all, when it says be at peace with everyone, you cannot be at peace with everyone within the body of Christ unless you are first at peace vertically with Jesus Christ. Peace is God's gift to a human race achieved by him at the cross of Jesus Christ. Before the cross, we were, beloved, at war. Again, I'll say it. We were at war with God himself. But God, through his riches and through his mercy, made peace with us through Jesus Christ, his son. Romans 5, 1 teaches us, Therefore, since we have been justified, that is a legal word, a forensic word, a term, we have been made right. We have been justified through faith. We have peace, Paul writes, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace. What is he saying? He is simply saying that before you can be at peace with one another, you must first be at peace with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For once you were at war with him, and then he made peace with you. You were at war with him because you were dead in your sins and trespasses. You were at war with him because there was an iron gate between you and God the Father, and that gate represented sin. You were at war with him because of our sinfulness, that during the fall we sinned and all have sinned through Adam. But then a new Adam came, and he broke down that wall. He gave us the key that opened the gate, and that key was Jesus Christ himself. But first and foremost this morning, I want to ask you, are you at peace with God? He signed a peace treaty. There was a warring that was going on. We were fighting him, and he was waiting to place his wrath upon us. But then he sent his only begotten son, and Jesus Christ signed in his blood a peace 
treaty. This word peace is mentioned throughout Holy Scripture. This concept of justification, of being made right, of knowing that God has declared you not guilty. It literally is a courtroom scene, a legal scene, in which God the judge takes off his robe, as I've said before, comes down and stands beside you and says, how do you plea? And you say, I plead guilty, for I know I am dead in my sins. This is what the table represents. But then Jesus, out of his goodness and his mercy, takes out, if you will, his checkbook, and he pays your debt in full. And then he looks at the court clerk and he says, enter it into the record. He is not guilty based on what I have done for him. He is now made right in the eyes of Almighty God. As God the Father now looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ's blood, the remission of sins. There is no longer a need for you to go around carrying, if you will, all of your guilt and all of your shame. Many of us carry these hefty bags full of garbage from the past, and we refuse to place them into the dumpster in which we release the sins of the past. But Jesus says, you are not guilty. And as you come to this table this morning, there is peace, beloved, because your guilt and your stain and your sin has been removed. An illustration that really impacted my life years ago was, I heard was a wealthy businessman living in the Midwest, owned many banks, and he was traveling through the state of Ohio, and he stopped and he came into the back of a church. He was not a believer. He was a moral man, if you'll allow me to use that term, but he was not a redeemed man. And he heard the small, he entered the small church and he heard this young pastor sharing a message of hope, a message of forgiveness. And he was touched. He says, my heart became warm throughout the message. And I began to understand the grace of Christ. The service ended and everyone left and this man was a man of great influence. And so he came to the pastor and they prayed together and then at the end he said, I want to give you a gift, a personal gift, a check. And the pastor said, no, I don't want your money. He goes, no, I want to give it to you. So he gave him a check and he ex accepted Christ and he went on and he said, I'll be back in a few months and I want to visit your church. So the young pastor, of course, went home and he hugged his wife and they were excited because as a young pastor they were struggling and he was looking forward to the next day going to the bank and depositing this check. And so the next day he rushed to the bank and he went there and he handed it to the teller and she took it and she kind of grinned and said, sir, I'm sorry, I can't deposit this check. And he cut her off and he said, what do you mean you can't deposit this check? Don't you realize whose check this is? And she said, I do. He actually owns 50% of the stock of our bank. I certainly do. But sir, until you endorse the check, I can't deposit it. He said, oh. There are a lot of people, beloved, in which they do not realize that Jesus has written a check in his blood to redeem them of their sin, to reconcile them back to him, to adopt them into the family. They are waiting and they don't understand it, but in God's grace and in his mercy, he is calling them, just as he is going to be calling us to this table, and this table represents that check that has been paid for your debt. It has been canceled. And now you can be at peace with God. There is no more need to be at war. You have been justified, made right by His grace. The enemy has been defeated. At that moment, he has been defeated. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3, in which you see God giving us a foreshadowing of the coming of his son 
when he says, you snipped, you struck my heel, but I will crush your head. Beloved, the evil one's head has been crushed. And you can live with hope and with joy and with peace. It passes all understanding. No matter what the future holds, you know that God is in control. He is the anchor of our soul. You can stand on that ship and look out at the waves of life and you can say, it is well with my soul if Christ reigns in there. Secondly and finally this morning, I think we not only need to realize that we have peace with God if we are in Christ, but we have peace from God. He can grant you the peace. Because God has made peace with us, we are called to show the effects of that peace in all circumstances. You are to live as much as possible, Paul says, with peace, at peace with others. What does that mean? That means that you are to seek ways to get along with other people. It doesn't mean you are to compromise. It doesn't mean that you are to appease. It doesn't mean that there won't be conflict. There's conflict in any healthy family. But you are seeking ways to resolve it. You are finding ways to be a peacemaker as much as is possible by the word of Almighty God. You have peace. It is to reign. It is to reign in your home. If your marriage is struggling, you are to find ways to be at peace with your husband or wife. If you cannot resolve it, you are to seek counsel. Because the ultimate goal is you will reconcile and you will work through it. Because God is a God of power, and he can bring healing to the home and to the relationship. You are to be at peace with those that are different from you. Paul says, be at peace with Jews and Gentiles. You are to be at peace within the church. You are to be at peace in relationships and community. Again, it does not mean that you will not take a stand. Daniel was a great example. He took a stand, but as we can tell, He's, his relationship, his integrity was so strong that he even won over a pagan king. Beloved, that requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Peace is the result of obedience to God and assurance that he is in control. Christ made peace, Christ gives peace, and Christ is our peace now and forevermore. And as you enter now a time of sacred, solemn, reverent reflection, I pray that you would pray for peace in your soul. And beloved, if there is one person here, I pray you will come up after the service if you want to experience the peace we're talking about and see me, Jerry, or any of our leaders I will be standing in the back. Please come, because, beloved, we want you to experience God's riches at Christ's expense, his grace. Now, as we prepare to come to the table this morning, I would ask you to please bow with me. Almighty and gracious God, we enter into our time of preparation now thanking you for the peace that passes understanding, thanking you that we can be at peace with God. God, I ask that if there is any unconfessed sin, that you would help us to confess our sins and know that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of unrighteousness. And I ask, God, that that peace that passes all understanding would guard our hearts now in Christ's name.